There are a lot of things I love about Orca Slicer, but one of my favorites is the calibration tools. Having built-in tools to dial in your machines and materials is incredibly powerful and makes it so much easier for anyone to get better quality prints. I use those tools pretty often and it's one of the reasons I put together a playlist covering each of them. Orca Slicer 2.3.1 has been in the works for some time, and while there is a lot of new things that are really exciting coming, some of my favorites are the changes and additions to those calibration tools. At the time of recording, 2.3.1 is still in beta, but I wanted to go over the changes as well as the new tools so that when the full version drops, you are ready. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Jumping right in, we have an update to the flow rate tool. For anyone not familiar with this tool, it's used to dial in the flow rate of your material or the extrusion multiplier. So that way the prints are as sharp as possible and you get better tolerances. This test used to require running two separate plates of parts, but in Orca Slicer 2.2, they introduced a new mode called YOLO mode. For most filaments, this brings the needed amount of test plates down to just one, since it uses a range starting at slightly higher than going to slightly lower flow rates. Determining the best settings from this test is largely a visual inspection, but in the video I did covering that tool, I mentioned I like to rub my finger on the top layer to see which one feels the smoothest without having any sort of gaps between those layer lines. With 2.3.1, the big change to these swatches is that the top layer is now using Archimedean cords for its fill pattern, starting with filling the corners and then spiraling out from the center, meeting up with the filament that it just laid down. This makes both the visual and feel tests easier to determine because the section where those two top fills meet up stands out much more than the old test where it's just zigzagging back and forth from one corner to the other. I tested this out with some PETG on my Sovel Zero and I ran one test with the previous or the traditional type of pattern that we've been using as well as one with the 2.3.1 updated pattern and I do really think that this updated pattern is going to get rid of some of the guesswork of trying to determine what is the best flow rate for your material. Next up, we have input shaper calibration. This is a completely new calibration tool to Orca Slicer. I feel like most people, especially those regularly watching my videos, are more than familiar with input shaping, but it's what allows you to print faster while minimizing or even in some cases eliminating things like ghosting and ringing that's caused by mechanical vibrations. Many modern machines come with accelerometers, which really help to automate this entire process. But if you have an older machine or are just in a situation where you can't run an accelerometer, then you have the ability to run this manual test. This test works both for Marlin and Clipper printers. In this video, I tested it out on the Sovel Zero, which is running Clipper. So if you are running this on a Marlin printer, just make sure to check the Orca Slicer Wiki for some of these small differences. It's been quite some time since I've actually ran a manual input shaping test, but from what I remember, this test is fairly similar to the one that's outlined in Clipper's documentation, with the main benefit of using Orca Slicer's tool is that it automatically imports the part and already applies all of the various settings that you'll need, so you're not having to manually adjust each setting to ensure this is running properly. To make this test as easy as possible on yourself, you want to use a glossy filament and preferably one that is opaque. In this case, I ended up using some PLA Pink PLA Plus from Voxel PLA. From the calibration menu under input shaping, start with the frequency test. In this window, there are two different tower options with one being the ringing tower and the other being the fast tower. My recommendation is to go with the ringing tower because I feel like it's easier to determine the best results from it. Then unless you know why you're changing a specific setting, leave everything as default and then click OK to generate the test tower. This imports a pretty big model, but the entire thing is just ran in vase mode, so it actually doesn't take all that long to complete. You'll also notice under both your material and processes that it automatically applied some settings. And I don't recommend really touching any of these settings 
with the exception in my case being that I needed to tweak the speed settings. In order for us to determine the best input shaper values, we need to basically force our printer to produce ringing or ghosting. And so it sets the speed of the outer wall to 200 millimeters per second and the accelerations of normal printing and outer, outer wall to 2000. Depending on your printer and its hardware, for example, if you're running this on a clippered, let's say Ender 3, those values of 200 and 2000 are going to be totally fine. But in the case of the Civil Zero, they had it already running at ridiculous speeds, so the changed speeds that were applied from this test actually slowed the machine down. So for the speed settings, I just went ahead and undid the changes that were made. So I set the outer wall back to 350 millimeters per second, the normal printing to 40K XL and the outer wall to, I believe, 16K XL. The last thing we need to do is enter a couple of commands into our Clipper console. I'll have these on screen so that you can easily see them as well as a link to Orca Slicer's wiki if you just wanna hop over there and copy and paste them. The first command sets the input shaper type. This determines which of the input shaping algorithms is going to be applied to your test print. And using the Orca Slicer documentation as a reference, the recommendation is to use MZV for all motion systems with the exception of Delta printers. So if you're using a Delta printer, make sure you change it from MZV to EI. Then we need to enter one more command to disable the minimum cruise ratio, since we want to emphasize ringing. Now we can run the print, and you don't actually have to let the entire print complete. If you see it's got lots of ringing, and then you hit a segment where there's little ringing and then no ringing, once you get to the section of no ringing, you can actually stop it. And also, obviously, if you see something going wrong with your printer, then make sure that you cancel the print as well. While this test looks similar to the one in the Clipper documentation, the main way that it differs is that we are not marking and computing the ringing frequency. Instead, we're taking a ruler or digital calipers and measuring from the base of the print up to the section where it looks the best or it has the least amount of that ringing and ghosting. I found it easiest to just look at the part and mark it with a Sharpie and then measure from the base up to the Sharpie mark. And you'll need to get two values. You'll need to get one side for the X direction and one side for the Y direction. If you don't know which side is X and which side is Y, if you flip the part over, there is a large X on the wall representing the X axis and a large Y on the wall that's representing the Y axis. So make your marks, take your measurements and write down those values. Once we've got those written down, we need to hop back over to our slicer and make sure that we are under the preview tab. Now we scrub the vertical slider on the right hand side for the different layers and match it up with the first value that we wrote down. The top number next to the slider is your layer count and the bottom number is the current height that you're at in that printed model. So for my Y, I marked it at 24.5 millimeters and moved the slider to the closest I could get, which was 24.45. Once you're at the height that you marked, grab the input shaper value from the G-code preview box and write that down. For my Y, this was 53.38. Then repeat this process for your second value. My X was marked at 21 millimeters and the frequency here showed 47.95. Now we're ready to run the second part of the input shaper test for damping. Under the calibration menu, select input shaping damping test and change the XY frequency to match the XY values that we just wrote down. Be mindful to enter the frequency you got for X in the first box and the frequency you got for Y in the second box on the right side. Then click OK to generate the test. The test is going to look identical to the one that we just ran, but it is running damping values instead of the different input shaper frequencies. Once this test completes, just like before, analyze both the X side and the Y side, get your Sharpie and mark the section that has the least amount of ghosting and ringing, and then measure from the base of the printed part to those marks. Then we'll hop back into the slicer under the preview tab and scrub the slider on the right hand side to the heights of the marks that we just wrote down. For me, this was seven millimeters for Y and six millimeters for X. Write down the applied damping ratios for those heights. My Y showed 0.047 and my X 
0.040. We now have everything we need to activate and apply input shaping for our printer. Head over to your printer's web interface and I recommend just doing a firmware restart to clear out any settings that may have accidentally been changed. Once it restarts, then open your printer.cfg file. Depending on your printer and its config, you may already have the input shaper heading with the list of arguments or values underneath it. And if that's the case, then you can just overwrite them with the ones that you got. If that's not the case, then you'll need to add the header as well as the values listed on screen, making sure to swap out your input shaper frequency and damping ratios on the X and Y with the ones you got from running the test. And once again, if you are not running a Delta printer, then you would have ran this using MZV. But if you do have a Delta printer, make sure you swap out MZV for EI. Then save and restart to confirm your changes and apply input shaping to your printer. This might seem like a lot of steps, but it's actually a fair bit easier than the method I remember doing when I was running it just using the Clipper documentation quite a few years ago. And in most cases, if you have the ability to add an accelerometer or use an accelerometer, that's what I would use. But if there's a scenario where you just can't, maybe you're, the host that's running on your machine is just not powerful enough. I know that was the case with older Raspberry Pis. Then having a streamlined manual method is really nice. The final new calibration method added is junction deviation. This is found under calibration and then cornering. And as far as I can tell, this is specifically a test for Marlin printers. The value set with this and determined from this test tells the printer how much it needs to slow down when approaching different corners of various sharpnesses. Junction deviation replaces the more traditional jerk value that used just a set value, giving it more of a dynamic range. Looking around at the printers that I have, I don't actually believe I have any machines still running Marlin, but based off what I saw, this test doesn't actually look too far off from what we ran when we did the input shaper tests. You have the same tower options, and in this case, I would probably recommend going with the fast tower. You'll need to run the tests and grab some values from that tower and then run it again to get the best results. But for anyone interested, I will have the link over to the wiki for how to do this process available in the description. Clipper specifically uses square corner velocity in place of jerk or junction deviation. And I did a bit of searching and the main consensus I see almost everywhere is just to leave it at the default value of five. But I also did see some discussion of people that were playing around with changing it or optimizing it or even trying to tune that value. Who knows as the printer hardware in the Clipper firmware continues to evolve and perhaps one day we will see a calibration option that we can run for our square corner velocity. And that's been updates and new calibration tools in Orca Slicer 2.3.1. There's also some really great new features coming, like a brand new seam alignment, updated color mapping for pre-painted models, resonance avoidance settings, and infill line multiplier, to name a few. I'll have a link in the description over to Orca Slicer's release page if anyone wants to go over there and take a further dive into some of the new settings and features that are coming. If there is one that you see that stands out to you that you'd like me to cover in further detail, be sure to let me know in the comments. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a new video just about every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you want to support the channel further, I'll have links in the description over to our Patreon where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.